everyone. Thank you so much for having me in here. Uh, yes, I was, this is the uh, Indianotco Pan American Goodwill Tour, apparently, because I was in uh, Cupertino a couple days ago, then Chicago a couple days before that, uh, and then barely missed the, uh, the, the flechette rounds that come from uh, being part of a Samsung product rollout, uh, and then had one of those weeks where as I'm packing in my hotel room, I remind myself to, oh, the laundry has to go on the top of the bag because when I get back home, I can take it out, leave the rest of it intact, do a quick wash, put it back in, then zip the bag back up. Uh, so <laughs> if I'm a little bit flustered, I hope that the, the seams are not too, uh, uh, too noticeable. Um, I'm gonna share with you uh, a small research project that I've been sort of looking at, uh, starting with a simple question I had about a, f a fixture at the Boston Public Library, and as research sometimes happens, trying to find the answer to one question re results in a couple more questions and then a couple of other interesting sidebars, and I hope you'll find this as interesting as I do because it's been a little bit of a uh, nice little adventure. Now, you probably, I, I should, uh, before I start though, there is some artistic nudity in this presentation dating from the late 1890s. However, I did think it would be sporting to make sure if anybody would be offended by that, they have an opportunity to bail right now. As if you stick around, you will find that there is an irony in my, having to, my feeling the need to announce that. Um, but let me start off by, tell, by talking about an incident that actually really happened at the Boston Public Library in the spring of 1897. The still cold and lifeless form of a 19-year-old woman holding a baby was placed inside a box, carried out right the front door by workmen. She had had a storied career in her nation of birth in, in Paris. She had been heralded, lauded. She had come to Boston hoping to find a permanent home, but when she got there, she was preceded by a reputation that she had not earned. She was called a bad influence. She was called uh, immature. She was called uh, smutty. She was even called by her worst of her enemies, a whore. It was a sad moment in a year-long battle to find out what her destiny was going to be, and when she was finally carried out, the people who at the Boston Public Library who had grown to know her felt the need to strew her little casket with, with flower petals, and according to a uh, report in a Kansas newspaper, tears were shed. Now, of course, I'm being clever here. This wasn't a live woman. This was a statue. Uh, by the name of Bacante and Infant Fawn. You're seeing the very top of that statue right here uh, by an artist by the name of Frederick Mac um, Let's go, before we get to the situation, though, that led to that very sad ending, let's talk about how this really wonderful piece of art was created. Let's meet the artist. This is Frederick Mac uh, He was about, uh, born in, about in the 1850s, had this immense career. He was one of these uh, people who knew he wanted to be a sculptor early on. Uh, when he was five years old, the family history says that he sculpted a figure of George Washington out of chewing gum on horseback, mind you. Uh, he started working uh, for Augustus St. Gaudens, probably the most influential and important sculptor of the time of the eight, uh, 1880s, showed so much promise that he borrowed $50 from, uh, from a more, more mature friend and traveled to Paris to start his studies. There he was accepted at the Academy des de Beaux-Arts, which is the best national uh, art school uh, there in Paris. So influential that a whole art movement called the Beaux Arts Movement came out of that school. And he exceeded so well, uh, so well there that two years in a row, he was named the top student of all the foreign class me members there. Uh, so this was somebody of whom great things were going to happen because he had the skills, he had the talent, and he had the passion for what he was doing. And almost immediately, he started creating really, really great work. This was his first public commission uh, in the United States. He was a Brooklyn guy, so he was uh, very, very pleased to receive this commission. Uh, a statue of Nathan Hale uh, for the park that's outside of uh, City Hall in New York. And you think about all the sort of fusty, you know, classical, even uh, 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 statues of, uh, of patriots and soldiers, and you look at how he was able to do his own interpretation of a moment in this character's history. Here he is, he is about 10 minutes away from death. His shirt has been torn open, his feet are, are bound, his, his, uh, shoulders, his uh, shoulders are bound behind him, and his neck is being made ready for the noose. And yet this is the expression on his face. 
uh, this is a, not the full size one, of course, uh, this is a replica that is at the uh, uh, Art Institute of Chicago, but I'm standing there and looking at it, and I'm thinking, if I were a British soldier and I was dropping the noose on this guy's neck, I might not think that we're going to lose the war, but I'd be sure that, oh man, if there are more guys like this, this is going to be a long few years. Uh, it is a very, very intense piece and a standout for its time, uh, very much a part of the new wave. So that really got, got, his, got attention for Mac Money's uh, for, uh, in the United States, and he started getting more commissions. One of the most significant he got immediately was the ceremonial barge, the barge of state for the World Columbian Exposition of 1893. This was a world's fair when it really was a world's fair. Uh, Olympics, but actually with economic benefits for the city that hosts it. He made this huge triumphal barge with Columbia, the, the, or the representation of the, of the United States, of the Americas, sitting above it with rowers and heralded by angels and holy mother of God, this is like putting a sapphire cover on a phone, even though you don't need to, just to show you can do it. Uh, and this became an international sensation. The world's focus was on this Columbian Exposition, and this was the centerpiece of the lagoon that everything was happening around. So everybody who wrote anything about the Columbian Exposition, anybody who wanted to photograph anything, anybody who wanted to draw anything, was drawing, photographing, and talking about this, and that made him an international superstar. So that's one way that this piece had a profound impact on the direction of Mac Money's life. The second one, is that one of these, the woman who, who posed for one of the rowers of this barge, uh, he had had an idea kicking around the back of his head of the sculpture he wanted to do. This was not a commission. This was not something that he was being paid to do. And this is not necessarily business. But he's a real artist. And he also really wants to push things forward. So he had this idea that he wants to really capture a moment of joy and fluid motion, just freeze that instant in bronze. And he'd been toying with this, with this idea, but it wasn't until he met this, this model uh, by the name of uh, Eugenie Pasqua uh, and saw the way that she moved and saw the way that she laughed and walked around that she said, that's the person that I need to sculpt for this. That's the perfect thing. I'm not going to be thinking about this. I'm going to immediately start working on this. And almost immediately, like while he's working on the barge, he starts grabbing a hunk of clay and starts doing what sculptors call sketches. Just, you know, he, he'll flatten it out afterwards, but just maybe, maybe this shape, maybe that shape, maybe not this. And it really was all due to uh, a drive to, once again, push things forward. He was a young guy. He did not learn 50 years of tradition of sculpting, which means that he got, out, he got his, his own neck out from the, new, the noose of neoclassicism. This is what we're looking at right here. This was sculpted in, in the 1850s by an American sculptor who was trying to make a figure of America. And OK, I guess there are stars on her Wonder Woman tiara, but this is Roman. It's Roman. There's nothing, it's, again, it's, 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 it's pretty in its way, certainly. Uh, it's certainly well executed, but this is what sculptors have been doing for 100 years, 150 years earlier when archaeologists uh, had uh, started digging up Greek ruins and Roman ruins, and the entire world culturally got saturated with the ideals of the Roman cities and the, and the Greek cities, or at least the idealized versions of them, saying, that, oh, we're going to be artistic people and scientific people, and we're going to read poetry. And so all of their art needed to focus, uh, needed to switch to this way, which is why you will see like the Houdan statue of uh, a bust of George Washington and again, it looks like Washington. You take out a dollar bill, say, okay, I don't recognize that guy. That's the, that's the one officer. Bring him in. But nonetheless, he, looked, he could be a Roman senator. This is, what, this is the mindset that people were stuck in. Again, it's pretty. And this, is, this isn't a race. We're not judging people and saying, you scored higher than this score. This isn't Project Runway. But nonetheless, this is familiar. This is common. This is what everybody in the world is used to. And he wanted to do things more like the Nathan Hale. So this is... What, just to give you another point of reference, this is a uh, statue of Daniel Webster by an uh, artist who's uh, very nice, uh, Thomas Ball. If you've ever been in the public garden, he did the equestrian statue of George Washington. And he also taught a lot of artists, so he was very, very influential. If you walk around Boston, around maybe a two-mile radius of that, you can point to at least a dozen statues that were sculpted either by him or by one of his students. Also, there's a public do in his autobiography, My Four Score Years and Ten, is in the public domain. Really great book. He, just, he was also a musician, and he really liked, the, really liked the nightlife. He liked to boogie. But once again, 
this, he was a prisoner of the limitations of the skills that he had been trained in and, and his age in a little way. Because again, very nicely done, but I'm Daniel Webster. I'm posing for, for, for bear, bearing bonds. That's, again, it's good, but it doesn't really change things. Meanwhile, in France and even in the United States, other artists were shaking things up. Uh, Augusta St. Gaudens, a name that's probably familiar to you, she, he did the Walking Liberty Dollar and was also one of these titans of sculpture and, and arts. He was not just a person who did influential art, not just a person who did popular art, but the sort of person who would find other artists like Mac Money's and say, that guy's got it. I'm going to promote him, I'm going to introduce him to the right people because this is the guy who can bring things forward. So here's what Augustus St. Gaudens did when uh, the, one of the founding, founding families of Springfield said, I want you to create a sculpture of one of my ancestors who was a Puritan. Ba ba bum ba ba bum Again, he's not just simply standing there, I've got my walking stick, I've got my Bible. He's got purpose, he's a man of destiny, he's going to set people on fire if they're going to be sending people to hell. Uh, I was surprised. I've been familiar with the sculpture, not until I read about it that I realized that, no, 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 this was somebody's great-great-grandfather, and they wanted to, please, depict my great-great-grandfather. This guy looks scary. And it's a very, very powerful piece. Again, another half-sized version of this that's in the Art Institute of Chicago. So Mac Munnies was working on all this sort of stuff. Um, before the other two pieces that I showed you, he worked, he did this piece, uh, a Diana. And here you can sort of see where the tide is starting to shift. It's very much a classical figure. It's Diana, the goddess of the hunt. But this is not the same stuffy, stoic pose. It's the same sort of, sort of idealized shape. You know, I, I, I don't have the art history experience to Go, to have the right terminology, but we all know what we're talking about when we talk about a Roman sort of figure, a Greek sort of figure, and Diana is that person. But you can see that, goodness, the flow and the motion in this that you would not see uh, in the 1700s or even the late 1800s. And this was his first big splashy piece. For the person, this is the one that got people to say, okay, Frederick, we're watching. Now what are you going to do next? And so, let me show you uh, what he did next. But uh, actually, before that, let me introduce you to, to Eugenie, or Nini as she was known. She was very, very well liked in the Paris art community of the early 1890s, uh, and also uh, very well known among them. He was, she was one of these people who were just friends to everybody. Uh, and uh, so she turns up in a lot of different pieces of artwork. Uh, as a matter of fact, Charles Dana Gibson, who did The Gibson Girl, he got shamed out of New York for a year when critics kept saying, you know what, you, all your girls look like the same girl. You gotta go see new girls. And so, no joke, he went to Paris <laughs> for a year to get new faces. And so she drew, there is Nini right there. And who's that? That is Frederick MacMoneys. That is the sculptor. So they were hanging out a little bit together. This is 1894, uh, after that famous sculpture, uh, the Bacanti got, got, uh, was sculpted. But here's another piece that he did that shows her a little bit better. Uh, it's said to be a very, very accurate drawing of her. Uh, you, can, uh, you, have to, <laughs> you have to either go on eBay and spend $80 for a page that was torn out of a beautiful book to get this. So I suggest you just go to a rare books library and ask to see it and then take a good picture of it. Uh, but there's no mistaking, these, the, the, this is the same person. Uh, and also, I have to admit that I did not understand what this hair was about until I saw this drawing here. Uh, now it makes, okay, now it makes perfect sense. Um, there are a lot of really cool stories uh, about her. Arr, come on, man. Ah, good Lord. No, I don't want to see the manual to my Olympus camera. There you go, thank you. Uh, there was a, a uh, she was well known enough as the model of the Bacante. Uh, there was a big mystery as to who modeled for this figure. Uh, and there was enough of a mystery that she became a little bit better known because of it, and there are a couple of uh, news stories about her. Uh, one writer in a, uh, believe it or not, a uh, Kansas City paper, I think, do I have that right there? Yeah, in the Kansas City Journal of her said, her sylph-like figure was always darting from place to place, and she was always playing some prank. She had a funny little way of throwing her head back and sticking a finger into her cheek. She was the heart and soul of any studio feast to which she might happen to be invited. Uh, I happen to have found and read the unpublished memoirs of Frederick Mac Money's uh, wife, who was also a very, very fine artist, uh, but she tells a story 
artist's ball that might shed some light on that quote uh, uh, partly. It was a masked ball, masked costume ball for artists in, in Paris. And so she went as Marie Antoinette. She did not have an invitation, so she was steering clear of her husband, who did have an invitation and was walking around, no joke, in a full bronze diving uniform. And when, he, when a friend would recognize him, they'd open up and pour beer down, down the helmet. It was a fun, fun time. Uh, but so she sees this woman who is being ca in a beautiful silk uh, brocaded uh, Japanese gown being lifted and carried around by, by laughing men. And she's laughing. She's having a great time. And she recognized this person as Nini for a couple of reasons. Uh, she says, uh, she, uh, for her, first because of her laugh, also, uh, she, she noted, as parenthetically, with admirable simplicity, Mary said, Nini wore nothing at all underneath the robe. Admirable simplicity. Uh, and she also recognized her because it was Mary's robe. I don't know what the story goes from there. I'm going to be looking into it. It's interesting, is it not? Uh, but uh, her backstory is the backstory of a lot of different artists' uh, models from back then. Uh, she. Uh, uh, had heart, uh, she had, uh, her parents had financial straits. She started modeling at 15, 16, 17, became hugely popular, uh, and then hopefully got out of the modeling industry uh, while her looks were still intact. But now let's get to the star of the show, the actual sculpture, Bacante and Infant Fawn. It took him about uh, two years to do it. He started in, in uh, 1893, finished in 1894, and it was said that while he was working on that barge, he was stealing as much time as he possibly could even though he was traveling to Chicago to oversee the installation. This is how obsessed he was about it. And for, before we get there, why a Bacante? And what is a Bacante? Well, again, we're still in that transition point where you can do whatever you, you can do a lot of what, what you want to do, but instinctively and also so that your audience will appreciate it, you will sort of couch it in classical terms. So when he first started sculpting this, he had like a, a, a nosegay, a little bouquet of flowers in the figure's hand. And then he said, okay, well, I'll make this a Bacante. The, a lot of artists will point Bacante. The, these are the temple priestesses of the goddess of uh, Dionysus or Bacchus. Uh, noted for drinking. Also, if you read more of the stories, dancing themselves into a total frenzy, uh, occasionally slaying the sons of gods because they are so drunk and so in a, a frenzy of ecstasy. But again, this is not necessarily something he really believed in as part of the subject, but again, that's the frame you have to put it in, or at least that's the frame he would think about putting it in. Uh, but so here's what we're talking about, Bacante and Infant Fawn. Uh, and just look at the life in this figure. And if you are, have a chance to see this in person, you will walk around it and around it just looking at it. Because the more you look at it, the more you see that he really did achieve his goal. This is an instant frozen in time. This character completely off balance, but of course completely prepared to continue her dance. And you try to look for a bad angle on this, and there is not a single bad angle on this. Uh, that's why it's kind of a shame, like at the uh, uh, Chicago Institute, uh, Art Institute, that it's kind of a, this, this uh, smaller copy of it is against a wall because you really want to walk around it. The full-sized version is 84 inches tall, so it's a little bit larger than, uh, than life size. And when you have the chance to walk around it, you find yourself continuing to rock, walk around it because the more you see it, the more you experience it, or at least my experience is that the more enchanted you get by this piece of work. I imagine it was a lot like the first time you saw Jurassic Park and the first time you saw real dinosaurs walking around and the camera can move too and people are interacting with it. It really did blow uh, everybody's minds. Uh, and it made a huge impression. This skyrocketed Mac Money's from a very well-known and popular and respected artist to an international superstar. They couldn't get enough of this. Uh, this, was, they, this, they, this was accepted by the Paris Salon of uh, 1894, which is the biggest exhibition, certainly in Europe, maybe even internationally, of new art. And it was such a sensation that France, the nation, did something they had never done before. They wanted to buy it. They wanted to keep it in the country and they wanted to buy it from Mac Money's and put it in uh, the Luxembourg Museum, which was a museum of contemporary art. This also helps us to understand what a big deal this was because it's a contemporary art museum. Uh, 10 years earlier, uh, in, 18, in 1880 some, 1883 or four, they were the first national gallery to host a, uh, an exhibition of impressionists, you know, Monet, Manet, Degas. Uh, they, 
the fact that they wanted to buy this and make it part of their permanent collection meant that they saw this not just as a very pretty thing, not just as a popular thing, not just as technically well done, but this is important. This is a, a, an inflection point for the future of sculpture, sculpture and we got to have it. And Mac Money's said, wow, what an honor. Sorry, I can't give it to you. Sorry, I promised to somebody else. I've actually given it to a friend of mine. And let me show you who that friend is. Uh, the architect of the Boston Public Library, a man by the name of Charles Fallon McKim, who was also a legend in his own right. He was one of the leading proponents of this bow arts movement. This was a style where you don't just build a building and then say, okay, there's a blank space there, let's buy a painting for that spot. You design the entire building to, to accommodate murals, and not just murals there, but specifically from this one artist that you have your eye on. You design an area for sculpture, but again, maybe even specifically a sculpture designed specifically for that area. Uh, and as a, one of the leading Beaux Arts and most respected Beaux Arts architects, uh, he had a very, very long list of artists he liked to work with, and Frederick MacMoney's was one of those people. As a matter of fact, uh, here's the, uh, here's the uh, Boston Public Library as it is today. It is a jewel box. The intention was to build a temple for the people. Seriously. Uh, this was almost unprecedented. The Boston Public Library was the first, what's usually acknowledged as the first public library uh, that was free for everybody. And as you can see, it's just full of art. Every square inch uh, has uh, different artworks in it. I'm not even giving you the full tour here, but there is not a square inch that is not filled with something charming and delightful. And this is why uh, people know I'm from the Boston area, and uh, so they, so they'll tweet at me and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be in Boston for two days. So what, what do you like to, what do you recommend? They say, oh, Boston Public Library. It's free. It's open all day. It'll take you two hours to get through it, but just wander around and just be impressed by being in all this, uh, this wonderful, uh, these wonderful places. So, uh, hello. Uh, so, Mac Money's was one of McKim's uh, favorite artists. Uh, and he approached, uh, he approached Mac Money's to do this uh, statue of Sir Henry Vane, the first governor of the uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony. And even though and he did this at the same time he was doing Bacante. So this is a commissioned work, so he has to make sure that it's palatable to the person he's making it for. Bacante was, I just want to experiment. I want to do this uh, and, and do this great. But even when he's doing something more mundane, look at it. It's just a beautiful piece of artwork. At the same time, though, uh, he's talking to his friend about this work he's doing. And he decides that, you know what, I'm going to give you the Bacante. I just want you to have it. Uh, because, you know that uh, person who loaned him $50 when he was a kid to go to Paris? That was McKim. And he was also responsible through his firm for putting $300,000 worth of contracts in his hands over the years. So there was another reason for him to be very, very, uh, uh, very, very uh, welcoming to him and also appreciative. And he knew very well that this was an important sculpture he was giving to him, not to the library, but to McKim personally. Uh, now, McKim, almost immediately, there's some fight, this is something I want to look into. Uh, there's some fussiness about what his intentions were, but almost immediately he decided that, oh, that would be perfect for the center fountain that we're building in the courtyard of the Boston Public Library. He, as a matter of fact, was himself donating this fountain. Of course, he's an architect. He's paid very, very well. This library was budgeted at $430,000. It was, came in finally at about $2.2 million. Oh, well. Uh, but he wanted to make this a gift to the library from him personally for reasons that hopefully we'll have time to get into later. Uh, and uh, when, uh, McMoney's found, when he found out that McMoney's had gotten all this acclaim for the sculpture, uh, when it finally was exhibited, he said, no, no, look, make, just make me a copy of it. That's fine. Do you leave the, give the original to France because that's important to them. Uh, it's a $30,000 contract they're going to give you. And he said, nope, I will not hear of it. That belongs to you. You're going to get it. Could, we, could I please hold on to it for about a year or two because I need, to, I need it for reference when I make the copy. I have the plaster mold, but there's some squinkies going on with the mold, so I'm going to need to, have, to hold this on. This is a letter that, he sent to, that uh, uh, McKim sent to the trustees of the Boston Public Library to explain what was happening. And here he is in his studio. You can see that he's already cutting the, it's a brutal process. There's a story about when his Diana was, his Diana was the first uh, sculpture that he had cast, and he had to look, he had to leave the room because professionals make the cast, and they start by cutting off all the fingers, and then cutting off the arms, and separating it so they can cast it, and then walling it up in plaster, and he like almost fainted to watch this happen to his Diana. Um, so that's great. The Boston Public Library is getting this immensely, not this beautiful piece of art, but also this 
important piece of art and this world famous piece of art. Yet another coup for the art collection of the Boston Public Library. McKimmon and going after the best artists in the entire world. And man, what a coup this was. So first, uh, it has to be approved by the trustees. Trustees said, hell yeah, absolutely. And then there was the small matter of the Boston Arts Council, Arts Committee. A panel of five people uh, from the senior uh, staff of, uh, I believe it was Harvard, MIT, the, Ma Ma the Museum of Fine Arts, Society of Architects and Engineers, and one, uh, I, think, I think even the Boston Public Library, uh, that have to, for every public sculpture, it has to be approved because it's going to be put on public display and it's going to become property of the city, so they have to do it. And so here's the trustees' room. And there was, now it's time for them to go off against the, uh, the Boston Arts Committee. And so they took two months, they got lots of opinions, and then they said, that's a great sculpture. We're not going to, you know, we can't let you do that. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot? They said, no, we don't think it's suitable for a public library. It was a five-person vote. They voted four to one against. The only person who voted for it was the member of the Board of Trustees of the Boston Public Library. And as you can guess, McKim did not, look favorably, did not think favorably about this. So he said, look, you've been spending two or three months, you've been getting a picture, all you've been looking at is a photograph from Paris and a little 14-inch table model that I, a friend borrow, I borrowed from a friend so that you can have something to look at. Even at this point, even this is in 1896, even at this point, it was so famous that McMoney's was making a lot of money on reproductions of this. But this was still the original. So they, McKim said, you can't, you, you can't just, it's intended to be inside this, this area, seen with water spraying around it, not like looked straight up ahead, but actually from 10 feet away, unless you're going to get your feet wet inside that fountain. Uh, they didn't think that it would fit in. But McKim's, one of his thoughts was this entire uh, courtyard uh, and the entire library is very, very traditional and very, very austere. I want people, when they're walking through the library and they finally see daylight for the first time, to see joy, to see something that doesn't fit in. I believe that that will be a wonderful experience for these people. So, <laughs> under the proviso they would not do this while the library was open to the public, they had the, the, they had the statue shipped at McKim's own expense, set up with temporary fountaining around it, and the uh, board and the trustees, the, the arts commission, and 100 invited guests on Sunday morning with the library closed got to see it. And the commissioner said, huh. He said, leave it up for a week. And they threw open the doors on that Sunday. People came in. They've been reading about this, God knows, for about a year. Uh, and they said, huh, that's beautiful. There had been people, even before the thing arrived, who said that this is a, it's a bacante. It's, she's just here to lure people into drinking. It's a celebration of alcohol and debauchery and frolicking and nudity. We can't have that in the library. And a lot of people were thinking, really? My God, maybe we shouldn't have it in the library. But then, no, that's beautiful. Go, go away. Be stupid someplace else. They kept it up for the entire month of November. They opened it up on November 8th. They finally took her down uh, at the very end of the month. And, and two days late, and, uh, November 18th, the committee sent a very nice letter. I don't know why it's torn to bits. But a second letter saying, we had a meeting yesterday. We decided, yes, we approve this statue. Hooray, huzzah. You did not do something stupid. <laughs> And so they took the statue down because it's winter in New England. All that stuff was temporary. They had ordered some blocks from Ireland uh, for, the, for the pedestal. All right, great, the, the good people won. And so you would think and hope that the story would end there. Unfortunately, that gave the, the months and months and months between the end of November when this was taken down and the spring when it was supposed to be put back up again gave her enemies time to entrench. And hopefully I'll, I'll have time to sort of go through the highlights of what the controversy about this statue was. Number one, obviously, this is when the temperance movement was really finding its spurs, finding the ability to impact power upon society. They felt like it was truly a religious and moral crusade. And the mere fact that you had this statue of a woman holding up a bunch of grapes uh, and also looking like maybe she's drunk, uh, newspapers had a field day with this. It sold a lot of papers with morning and afternoon editions of four different uh, daily papers in Boston. If you wanted to r get uh, another goose for page three, you'd find another story to write about that drunken naked dancing woman that, uh, that's in the Boston Public Library. Uh, so that was problem number one. 
The nudity was also kind of a problem, but not really. We'll get into that. Surprisingly enough, not really a problem. Um, but the other problem was that this was not the first battle that the Boston Public Library had had to fight with some of these puritanical conservatives. This is the seal of the Boston Public Library, as designed but personally by Augustus St. Gaudens. It is above the doorway of the main entrance of the library. See if you can guess the two problems that, or maybe six problems, that uh, the, uh, the Puritans would have against that. And they were told, look, it's, they're cherubs, they're asexual, just go away. There was, uh, they had uh, some, th this is the great hallway that I sort of, sort of rushed you through before. It is completely covered with murals from uh, Pierre Puvis de Chevan. I might pronounce that correctly. He is very French, I'm very not French. Uh, but is the one of the last major works he did in his, in his old age. It is essentially, this figure here is kind of like a Prometheus figure, genius, being attended by spirits, and he is basically imparting wisdom to the world from his celestial hands. Uh, let me go a little bit closer so you can see it a little bit better, and see if you can guess the little addition that was made to this mural after some people raised a stink about, yes, once again, reproductive organs on a mythical figure that was going to caused big problems for everybody. They said, you know what, fine, we'll, we'll, put, them, we'll put, them, put them in a veil, we'll put them in a Merkin veil or whatever it is we're going to do that. Fine, you won that one. But that's the environment that they fell into. The best, to the people who felt as though they are the, they, they are the people who are protecting the, the moral fiber of their community, the BPL was a battleground. They had won one, they had lost one, and they're paying close attention to what's happening, and they're not going to let them get away with any nonsense. Uh, the other problem is that we forget how new this was. They'd, never, they'd almost never seen anything like this. The average person certainly had never seen sculpture like this before. So they really didn't, it's, it's like getting a, a, a computer or a phone with a new user interface. You don't know whether you just don't understand it, whether it's a bad thing, it's a terrible thing, badly made, poorly thought out, or whether it's so new that your brain just isn't wired up to deal with it yet, and in time you will come to appreciate how incredible this is. Of course, in this case, it is the latter, but try telling everybody else that. Uh, to, just to give you an idea of how bad this problem was, is there a problem with this lion? This is one of the two lions uh, that uh, guard the staircase. Uh, an art architecture critic came in uh, when the building was open but not filled with art yet, and praised the entire building but dinged the lions because the lions were undignified. Uh, they thought they did not have the dignity of the Sphinx. He's just sort of a casual, how's it going? I'm the lion. Cool marble, hot day outside, just thought I'd sit there. Don't mind me. I've eaten. <laughs> joking, joking. Look at, look at this face. Oh, God. Um, sculpted by Augustus St. Gaudens' brother, Louis, who took such pains with it that he, he refused to release the, the, the master sculpture until he got his brother to come in and sign off on his work. But that's what we're dealing with, people who are not ready to accept this level of realism and take it for what it actually is. Again, I think this is funny. This is one of the murals that was put into the gallery. Each mural reflects a different branch of science, literature, uh, history. This one represents physics. And so, exactly. Let me, let me explain this to you. This is physics. There's panels for chemistry, epic poetry, lyric poetry, history, archaeology. Uh, the one for astronomy is a shepherd in a field in a toga looking like this. I, I, I kid you not. So I'll, I'll unwind this one for you. For physics, Pubis de Chavon decided that, okay, how about we're going to electricity, because that's a phys physics something like that. And we'll, I'll do something about this miraculous new telegraph wire. But of course, because he was 73, 74 years old, he always thinks in classical terms. He can't be abstract. He says, here are two telegraph wires right here and here, and here is good news and bad news, both gliding along instantaneously on this miraculous telegraph wire. <laughs> this is what people were used to and dealing with. If you give them something a little bit abstract where it is not going to be spelled out for you what this means, misunderstandings can happen. What I feel it's like, it's like when Richard Pryor and George Carlin came on the scene, where for decades, if you saw a stand-up comedian who is, looks shabby and is talking in vulgarities and talking about what they're doing with parts of their bodies that do not belong to be talked about on a, on a comic stage, you know, all the people who fit that description before were hacks who were just trying to get attention and just trying to startle people. When you finally see somebody who's actually using this to advance the art, it's very, very difficult to, to see this as something new and as an advancement of that art. So really, the Vacante was very much in these two molds, I think. 
But the other problem was he called it Bacante. He put a sticker on it saying, this is Bacante. And well, I, don't, I thought Bacante is women who get drunk and go into a frenzy, but I, I'm probably wrong. What's, let me go into the encyclopedia. No, that's exactly what it is in mythology. They, uh, they, uh, they killed Odysseus, I think. Uh, they were known for all kinds of naughty and nasty behavior. And that's the, he had the Dymo labor maker, B-A-C-C-A-N-T-Y, and stuck it on there. That's the name he chose to put on there. And of course, that's what a lot of people thought his intention was and the subject matter. So people can't really be blamed for this. As a matter of fact, Edward Robinson was the uh, curator of antiquities at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. After the sculpture was finally accepted, he wrote this letter to his friends, uh, McKim and uh, St. Gaudens, saying, look, I'm an expert on classical literature, this has nothing to do with the Bacante. There's no reference to it. What if we were to, could you get Mechmanis to rename it to something like Nymph and Infant Bacchus? Because she's in a fountain, so she's surrounded by water. The, uh, the uh, water nymphs raised the infant Bacchus. They were known to be very kind, very loving, very fun, free-spirited individuals. Now the context of the, of the grape bunch is that this represents what the infant is going to be associated with. It takes totally the curse off of it. It costs us nothing. Uh, St. Gaudan said that was a great idea. Uh, they also, uh, Daniel Chester French, another titan of uh, sculpture, was advised, oh, that's a great idea. Let's get that to, idea to Mac Money's immediately. I don't know what his response was. For, unfortunately, he never had a chance to uh, use that problem. Now, the language that the committee used, but we don't feel it's, it's appropriate. That's another thing. You, you think that they might have meant about the, the drinking part or the nudity part. And they certainly did address that outside of their comments there. Another part of it, though, was that they were wondering if this was really uh, appropriate. Did it, did it fit in with the library? Here's the courtyard of the Boston Public Library in 1925 and, and three days ago, as a matter of fact. And it is not for art lovers. It is for people coming in, not even necessarily to check out books, but to enjoy the day and sit down and socialize and read and improve themselves. And if you give them something, are they there to be challenged by a new piece of art they're not going to understand? Maybe not. And also remember that video tour uh, I showed you earlier. Here is the, the third floor. John Singer Sargent did this huge mural sequence on the top floor uh, about the, technically called the triumph of religion, but he basically goes through the entire history of religion, starting from pagan ages, the pagan times, and going into the modern times. He spent 30 years on it, and he died before he finished the very last piece of it. And so this is the character of the art that's in that building. Uh, it's very dignified. Even though this is very fresh and this is very modern, this is not the same stultifying sort of uh, forms we see with a Mr., uh, Mrs., Mrs., Mrs. Uh, telegraph wire there. But it's still solemn and dignified, and you're meant to wipe a single tear about the beauty of it. You're not meant to say, oh, wasn't that charming and delightful? So they were, a lot of people, uh, the committee included, thought that, well, in an art gallery, this would be perfect. In the Museum of Fine Arts, I'd love it. In the library, maybe it's not the right thing to do. Here's another painting, The Quest and Achievement of the Holy Grail. I'll skip right past that. Please go to the Boston Public Library to see, to see all this sort of stuff. Sorry if I'm talking fast, but I'm excited, and I want to make sure I get through all this. So that's the situation that was festering when uh, Bacante was put into storage. The fight against it was almost immediate. The sensation was national, almost immediate. And the influence that Bacante had on the culture was insane. It's, here, here's, how, here, here's how big it was. Political cartoons all across the nation incorporating the Bacante. Eventually, it got so popular and so well known, and also the controversy that you know, if you're a political cartoonist in Chicago and there's an alderman who's kind of a drunken lout, you might draw him doing, going like this, and everybody would understand you're saying he's drunk and he's in a frenzy. That's how, uh, how well known this, uh, this sculpture was. There was a, a, a silverware pattern in 1895 with a Bacante on it. A silverware pattern. This came a little bit after the controversy, but a, an al a beer company, oddly enough, decided to uh, appropriate that image and trademark it. Why is that low resolution? Uh, and trademark it as the, the trademark of their company. So there were tens and hundreds of thousands of, of, of beer bottles with the Bacante on it. So needless to say, the fact that this had become a national sensation did not please the Puritans who were opposed to it to begin with. They were very, very pleased when the committee uh, said no. They were very not pleased when they uh, reversed themselves. And so they start mobilizing. These are preachers, not only preachers, but committees of preachers, mobilizing their congregations. Here is a, a, a petition 
that arrived at the Boston Public Library. And gosh, that's kind of unfortunate that so many people, one, two, three, four, 18 people, probably after church went around and passed this around. Yeah, the bad news is that's just the very top edge of it. It's five and a half feet long and it's double-sided. About 280 people signed this petition and that's only one of the petitions that they received saying, please reverse your decision. We will not have Bacante in our public library. Here's a letter from the Baptist Ministers Conference. I single this out because if you notice, I, it's so glad to know that there's our constants in, uh, in culture that transfer uh, uh, across all, all generations. Everybody who feels as though they are the moral character that needs to be inflicted upon the world, none of them can spell worth a damn. They misspelled statue every damn time. <laughs> At least they're consistent, right? They're categorically ruined. I probably don't have time to read this whole thing to you, but this one piece uh, really does show off I've read dozens and dozens of letters and a couple of sermons. This one newspaper piece that the uh, Congressional Club of Clergymen and Laymen of Boston vicinity, sort of a brotherhood of, of, of preachers, and said, basically said, here's the reasons why we are opposed to this, because people are thinking we're just no fun Puritans. But look, we have real reasons. The, the statue is not simply nude. It is glaring and obtrusively naked. It is a, an offense to the temperance sentiment of the community that it should be placed in the public library any status intended to glorify intoxication. The cons I'll read just this, this one part, or one more after this. The consideration which is urged against this only, only increases the force of the objection, namely, that the eyes are not bloodshot, nor the hair disheveled, but that the joyousness of alcoholic exhilaration is set forth. This mask, this beautiful mask upon the hideous features of the drink fiend, but adds one more reason against it. They're also upset uh, because of the person that they think posed for it, uh, let me see if I can skip ahead and find it. Because it's really, this is, I chose this one because it's rather tame and some of these are. And now Boston is to accept for such a place in its library a statue which has been vulgarly advertised to the world as the effigy of a Paris prostitute. And the papers rake the, rake the brothels of Paris to find and publish to the world incidents of her disreputable career, which has dragged her unsavory name to the untimely grave that had covered her dishonor. Uh, actually, she, uh, Mac Money's himself said, you know, uh, Nini, you're 20, you're 21, you still look good, you're going to be 28, 29, and your uh, people will have moved on from you. Let me start taking, introducing you to proper society and high society teas. Uh, and he actually set her up on a blind date with a rather well-to-do businessman from Brooklyn uh, whom she married, and then she left the, uh, the, the modeling business. So she did okay. So all of this is going on to the consternation of these people involved. Uh, what did Mac Money's think about this? This is a card that uh, is in the Boston Public Library's archives that I was very, very kind of touched to, to see. Because I'm wondering, he didn't, he didn't design it for the library. He didn't donate it to the library. He didn't know what was going to happen to it. Did he, what did he feel about it? And he said in his own handwriting, if I did not, if he did not consider the statue appropriate for the public library, it would not be there. And there's my signature. Drop the mic. McKim, <laughs> McKim however, was flabbergasted that this thing was going on for so long. Uh, he felt the need in the spring, as this thing was not dying down, to quietly tell the trustees, look, if you, if you really want this to be over with, I'm sorry to have got so much trouble, let me know and I will withdraw it and you don't have to have the responsibility for turning it down. All I ask for the love of heaven is that this matter finally be determined. So I'm gonna end with two things. I've got maybe a few minutes left. Quick lessons that, you le that were learned from this. I hope we get to the very end because this is going to be cool. First, be ready to defend your work with blissful arrogance. This is something I do when I write. I work so hard and I second guess everything I do when I write because when I publish it, everything I put there has to mean what I want it to mean. So I don't want it to say Bacante when it actually means something else. Another thing, unless you never show your work to others, you have a duty to communicate your work clearly. People don't know what you're thinking. So don't get all upset when people misunderstand what your intentions are. Because pure idiots are indeed quite rare. Uh, they're, do they're making the best choices they can with the information and the experiences that they have. Maybe the fact that you can't see your work and see your projects from the outside uh, is, the ability, is the thing that's uh, causing so many problems for you. And then do things that are great and enduring regardless of the struggle because it's worth it. Here are two different statues. Uh, a very curious photo, a Photoshop job in 1897. A sculptor who I think, I'm researching this right now, 
I think he was just trying to piggyback on the attention of Bacante, because he had this, he got this interview with a magazine saying, oh yes, well, now that Bacante's been, uh, the, the Bacante was uh, finally turned out, uh, sorry, McKim finally, the, blah, 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 blah. the trustees finally said, yeah, this is going on too long, this is too, taking too much effort, this is too much of a stain, and so McKim withdrew the, the, the statue, offers the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, who snapped it up in one second. And so this sculptor said, that, hey, I've got this, they've, they also, they've already accepted my next statue, which is I'm calling the Spirit of Research, which is another one of these dumpy uh, neoclassic stuff that you would look, walk past three times and not even notice once. Isn't it better to have created something like this and gone to all the trouble of creating something like this? But, and this is one minute, I think, uh, this is the cool postscript. What is the Bacante doing here if the one that, the one that was got so much acclaim in New York and so much uh, ire in Boston is on display today at the Metropolitan Museum of Art? Well, here's what happened. Uh, it is, in fact, there. This is the, the actual version we've been talking about at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. There are actually four of these 84-inch versions of it that have been done specifically, specifically by Mac Money's studio. This one done specifically by Mac Money's hands. This is a photograph of the version that was made for the Luxembourg Museum. It's still in France right now. It's now in, in, in a French-American museum because the Luxembourg is just for living artists and he passed away in, in 1930-something. Then, however, in 1901, Mac Money's made two copies as bit commissions for very well-to-do, very, very well-to-do collectors. One of these, went to England. We don't know where it is. It was either melted down, bombed out, or someone has it and is not showing anybody. We have no idea where this multi-million dollar statue is. The fourth version of it was made for a New York City collector who died. It went to auction in 1910, and an amazing benefactor who was legendary in the city of Boston, who was still upset that Boston had refused this statue, bought this statue at auction and donated it to the Museum of Fine Arts so that the city would have its Bacante finally. I should point out, I'm going to go one more minute over. I'm sorry, this is going to be so good. Because I, I, who's here from New York and who's from, consider themselves from the Boston area? Boston area people? Okay, good. We'll stick it to New York. So you could sort of say, you're, you're going to like this. There is a, it shows you how deep the rivalry between Boston and New York goes. So yes, Boston was a national laughing stock for having refused this statue, and New York was quite right to have accepted it. They got a little bit of pushback from their own puritanical uh, groups, but they said, no, go away. Uh, however, you notice there are differences between these two. When Mac Money's studio made this copy in 1901, Mac Money's did something very, very unusual. Normally, his job is to be sculpting brand new commissions, brand new park sculptures, brand, brand new monuments. He would basically, he has assistants who would do most of the work of pouring the mold, getting it ready for, then he would go and make sure it was all right, sign off of it, and then go back to creating brand new things. He did something very interesting. His, one of his assistants wrote in a letter to her friend about how Mac Money's ordered that this statue not be cast in this normal casting compound, but cast it in plasticine. And he himself personally spent a day and a half, two full days, working on one tiny section of this statue changing the surface of it, because he was never happy with the final surface of this thing. He did not even have the same foundry cast this, uh, this copy. He took him two whole days on this tiny, tiny section. Then he called this very, very trusted assistant over and said, here is, look, see this section here? Here's the steps that I did to get this sort of beautiful, luminous surface. And he taught her all the steps and all the chemicals and all the bleach and all the treatment. And he said, your job is to make the entire figure look like that. Take the entire rest of the year if you have to, but make the entire figure look like that. And that's the version that we got. So we can say that, yes, you got the one that was exhibited in Paris. Yes, you got the one that we sent away. And yes, you got the one that is historically more significant, but we got the better one. You got the beta copy. Ha, 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 ha. That is a very rushed version of the sort of fun that I've been having uh, over the past year or so looking into this. Uh, but as I say, if I leave you with one thing, please check out the Boston Public Library. It really is an undiscovered gem for so many people. If you are in your 40s and you haven't seen it, you've walked past it a million times. You, uh, right before my talk, someone came up and thanked me for uh, recommending the uh, comic book font sale that's uh, every year, and I tell them, that no, no one, do, every, I, I never get any more positive feedback than when I talk about this sale. This really is the best recommendation I can give you because people come in from out of town, they see it, they say, my God, this is one of the nicest experiences I had in my life. 
Thank you so much for your patience. I'm sorry for going a few minutes over. Cheers.